Well, let's pray as we come to this part of God's word. Uh, Father, we are so grateful that you speak so clearly. Uh, We thank you that you've opened our ears and you've given us ears to hear. And we pray that would be increasingly the case for us, that we'd be those who listen well to your word and respond with our hearts and and all of our lives. We uh, pray that the word you speak to us today will meet us where we are and uh, lead us to greater maturity and greater freedom in the gospel. Amen. Well, I've been married to Ashley for 20 years, but it took me, I think, 10 years to see the importance of really listening to her. That's a long time, isn't it? Uh, We were living in Mongolia, and Ash used to say lovingly often that I was doing too much. It wasn't good for the family, it wasn't good for her, and it wasn't good for me. But press on I did, thinking God and our financial uh, supporters expected me to be at least this busy, and it's for the kingdom. Well, after a few years, the effects of chronic stress began really taking their toll, and I was forced to wisen up and slow down. She was right all along. I'd heard what she was saying, but I, I wasn't really listening as I looked back. It's like when you're talking to someone and they're typing an email or a text and you know they're not really listening to what you're saying. And anything they pick up is just going to be pretty superficial. We might hear, but we're not really listening when we're like that. And Scripture's pretty condemning of a life that doesn't listen. Proverbs highly commends humble listening. David opened a service with a verse from Proverbs, an example. Or what about this great memory verse from Isaiah 5? Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Now, a verse like that will really resonate with the humble, but the proud will dismiss it. Nothing really for me to learn in that one. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. I wonder who that's talking about. It's a danger for any semi-competent person, wise in our own eyes, clever in our own sight, And I wonder, could it be for us as Christians, even Christians who've been a Christian for a long time, are we still like me in that first phase of marriage where we're getting along as Christians, but we're not really listening? We haven't learned yet to listen well. If you aren't actively sceptical of your own wisdom and your own impulses, if you're not actively earnestly seeking God's guidance for your life, then you're likely in a slow growth mode or even in a spiritual rut, and you perhaps can't even pin down why that is. Who are you listening to? Not who do you suppose you are listening to, but who are you listening to? For your life's direction, priorities, your sense of self even. And amidst the online and the cultural and the podcast world and the self-talk alternatives that we have, who really are you listening to? God says to us first, listen to Jesus. If you take nothing else from this morning, listen to Jesus. And second, once you're listening, listen to him with increasing confidence in your Christian life. Keep growing in your faith. As we've been looking at in recent months, Mark 1 to 8 raises the question and then answers it, who is Jesus? And we see he's God the Son, he's our King. Well, so what? Well, so, chapter 9, verse 1, this early section, so listen to him. If that's who he is, listen to him. Very shortly, the kingdom's king will be powerfully seen. Some of those standing there this day, Peter, James, and John, are about to see the glory of the divine son, unveiled. As Moses and Joshua went up the mountain of Sinai for six days, and they saw God's glory unveiled before them, so too here is the New Testament equivalent of that Old Testament moment. Look with me from Mark 9, verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here with me will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Now, like many of Jesus' teachings, this could be applying to a few different things. It could be referring to Pentecost, where the power of God is seen visibly in manifestations. It could be in the resurrection where the power of God is seen over death. But in three of the Gospels, where this sentence is spoken, it's followed immediately by the transfiguration, 
where the glory of God is seen in this next event. Verse 2. After, notice, six days, similar to the Exodus account, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain. Here we go, up another mountain, hold on, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before Elijah and Moses, and there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Has there been a more glorious sight in world history? And for Moses, it's deja vu. 14 to 1500 years earlier, he was also on the mountain with the glory of the Lord. Back then, he asked to see God's face, but only saw the back of his appearance, his presence. But now, God can see the Lord's face in the Lord Jesus. God can be seen with the Lord Jesus' face, another way of putting it. Key witnesses are there, as we might expect, from another mountaintop experience, another massive revelational moment. Moses is there, the authoritative lawgiver, if you think of Genesis through to Deuteronomy. And then the great prophet Elijah is there. So here stand representatives of revelation, the law and the prophets. Well, who's with them? We have Peter, James, and John the next generation of revelational agents. The men Paul later would call the pillars of the church, faithful Jews who will see Judaism fulfilled, now an international church made up of all nations. They'll lead Israel into Israel phase two. And so Moses and Elijah have been dwelling with with God. They seem more accustomed to the glorious Jesus. They're there in conversation with Jesus. Verse 4, but Peter, James, and John aren't so accustomed to glory. Peter is disoriented. He's frightened. He doesn't know how to respond. Verse 5, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. The other gospels say they're lying down, face down in the dirt. Verse 7, then a cloud appeared and covered them, as often happens with God's presence in the Old Testament, mountains, clouds, voices, and so too here a voice came from the cloud. What's the message? What's the whole point of this extraordinary occasion? Well, we see the message in verse 7. This is the message God wants to express. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This time it's not the I am who I am, glorious but elusive statement given to Moses. Now God is being absolutely clear for us, more concrete, more graspable, more visible, more audible, relatable. Humanity, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. My revelation will flow from his mouth. Now, papal infallibility has a go at this, where the Pope hopes to offer new authoritative divine truth. In Protestant churches, we put personalities too on platforms and consider them to be divine voices, some of whom fall terribly. And no spokesman of God can be without inevitable distortion. But where the popes and podcasters are hit and miss, Jesus is only and always hit. Hit, 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 true, 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 wise, wise, wise. Listen to him as the voice above all voices. But he's not only true and wise, he's also the key to understanding the universe and God himself. This is my son. Next part is significant as well, isn't it? Whom I love. King David, in his own fallen way, was a man after God's own heart. But Jesus is perfectly so. And he has been from all eternity. And so at this mind-boggling moment, God presents himself to the world in the person of his son, witnessed by the biggest hitters of revealed truth, radiant, glowing with unmasked glory, holiness, and power. Now, Peter never forgot this encounter for the rest of his life. And seeing it with the eyes of faith today, we would be so blessed if we never forgot it with the rest of our lives either. 
November 14, 2021. You might like to write it down. The day through the living voice of Scripture, we saw Jesus' glory and our life could never be the same again. Scripture is not a dead historical book. It's the living and active words speaking today. This is a window for us. In Peter's two letters, the only historical account he mentions, or he recounts at least, is this one in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's the day when any doubts he may have had about Jesus' divinity was put to rest. His equality with God, his godness. You are the Messiah, he works out by Mark chapter 8. And by Mark chapter 9, he's saying, you are God the Son. Now, the things that don't need to be said are the very things that need to be said, aren't they? Words like, sorry, I love you, don't forget your toothbrush. But so we don't have any chance of missing what should, should be known but needs to be said. God the Father says in just two words in the Greek or three words in English, the message we aren't to miss, the implication of who Jesus is. Obviously, if Jesus is this Son of God, we are to listen to him. It's a word to Moses, it's a word to Elijah, to Peter, James, John, Israel, the first century world, all creation for all time. Let those with ears to hear, Mark chapter 4, hear, listen to him. The creator has entered his world like never before. His goodness and his will now forever unmistakable. Listen to him, the words and the teachings, and notice the example of Jesus and the way that teaches us, all of which confirm the, all of the Old Testament, which promise this moment. So it's one thing to say that. How do we go about doing that? How do we listen to Jesus? Well, though pastors will come and go, whether Craig or Daryl or Sandy or Dave, Christ is always and always will be the head of the church. And it's always his voice that matters. It's his word that must never be set aside for any well-meaning alternative. Martin Luther grew up in 15th century Germany where the word of God was not at all taught plainly and clearly. And it led to devastating distortions in church life, church practice, in society. And again, I don't want to pick on Roman Catholics. The same is true for Protestant churches today where they leave the Bible aside. Martin Luther said, no greater mischief can happen to a Christian people than to have God's word taken from them or falsified so that they no longer have it pure and clear. No greater mischief can happen. For me personally, this means preaching as clearly as I can and ensuring our church has word ministry going on as a priority. I almost can't wait to see what Jesus will say as we're seeking to listen to him over the next two months as we go from Mark 9 to 16. Home group leaders, youth group leaders, grandparents, parents, we want to be people listening to the word because we're conveying what we know and we're sharing that word with others. Listen to him. Listening to Jesus for me means also listening less to other voices. Or when I'm listening to other voices, I'm doing it with more awareness of how what they're saying matches with what Jesus says and also how what they're saying is influencing me and my priorities. I like reading the newspaper to catch up on news. Um, I like watching news and uh, I tend to watch YouTube news more these days just to get the news that I'm looking for. But I notice that the news has an effect on me. Um, my last Friday, I have a day of rest on Friday normally. So I had a scripture verse going on in my mind. I, I knew I needed that because I was planning to read the paper. Um, I, I read in the afternoon a Martin Lloyd-Jones chapter. Um, I want to speed, feed myself spiritually while engaging with the voices of the world. Where is the bulk of your messaging coming from? Which voices do you feed on? What is their effect on your vision of Jesus, his kingdom, your pilgrimage to your, your eternal home? What are the tabs on your internet? Uh, what does YouTube say about you? Do you have songs and hymns also ringing through your minds and your hearts? I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. 
Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till travelling days are done. This hymn writer was one who loved the voice. I heard the voice of Jesus and loved the vision of Jesus, and it's shaping the way this person's living. I spoke recently about um, potentially looking at our buildings here at DPC in the coming months or years. And I hope that might happen if it's the will of the church in, in times ahead. But I tell you what's more important to DPC's future, and that is our diet. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God. It's as simple as that. Our church wants to be listening to the Word of God for the Spirit of God to do the kinds of things we'd love Him to do in ourselves and in our church. We could be divided, inward-looking, grumpy, apathetic, worldly group of mere churchgoers. Or we could be those who listen to Him, enamoured by the Son, curious, drawn, earnest, humble listeners of his words of life to us. A church family having a red-hot go at listening to what he says. Imagine a church together and individually in private life as well as public life where we have no greater ambition than to hear and to heed our good shepherd's voice. Our great question, who are we listening to? First, God would say, let's listen to him. And second, the obvious implication from that. Keep learning to trust what he says. Keep growing in your faith. Keep growing in your confidence in his voice. Not just knowing what he says, but trusting it. Do you remember when Moses descended from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments? He found masses of people worshipping a golden calf. There was chaos, immorality, faithlessness. And poor old Moses couldn't bear it. He threw down and smashed the sacred stones, freshly engraved by God himself. That's serious frustration. Well, so too in the next section, Jesus descends the mountain, verse 9, and finds himself in a similar world. Jewish leaders are taking on Jesus' disciples. Satan's having a field day, possessing a young boy. Jesus enters into this faithless chaos. Jesus could have gone home to the Father with Moses and Elijah. That would have been a more pleasant uh, time ahead. But he's determined to first pay the penalty that the world brings on itself. And so he rejoins the crowds with his golden tongue and with his crucifiable body. He's still got work to do. In verse 14, we see the scribes are arguing with Jesus' disciples. And in verse 17, we pick up the story of a harassed boy at the centre of a controversy. Uh, Matthew's gospel labels it as uh, epilepsy, as well as a spiritual oppression. Jesus asks in verse 16, what are you arguing with them about, the disciples about? A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I have brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that's robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Next, next Jesus says to the religious leaders and the crowds giving his disciples a hard time, words resembling the despair that Moses felt. You unbelieving generation. It sounds harsh, but I think this is why. It's a similar experience to Moses. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Nevertheless, Jesus kindly says, bring the boy to me. And so they brought him, and when the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion, not leaving without a fight. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. It's a madness like we saw with the demons heading to the pigs and off the cliff, destructive, last-ditch chaos. Jesus asked the boy's father, verse 21, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Now, this father didn't see the transfiguration that had just happened. 
He seems to think Jesus' power has limits, like the disciples' power does. It's like a child saying to his teacher at school, excuse me, Mrs. Jones, but if you can read, I've got a letter here from my mum. If I can read? Or like kicking the tyre of a Formula One racing car and asking the driver, well, does she go all right? Does she go all right? You don't know what you're dealing with. Verse 22, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. We might not get all we want in life, but if we trust the all-powerful one, we have power enough. His is the power. His is the will that ultimately matters. The desperate dad had no doubt, no doubt was stressed by everything going on. He seems to be trying to catch up with Jesus and who, whose presence he's in. He's learning on the fly, verse 24. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me un- overcome my unbelief. That's a great prayer, isn't it? For him, for me, and if I may say, for you as well. We can't, at the end of the day, manufacture faith. We can exercise it, but we are ever dependent upon the Spirit of God for it. We are to pray for faith as we exercise it. Of course, Jesus took care of the rest from that point. Jesus gives the evil spirit no choice but to listen to him and do as he commands. And Jesus takes the lifeless boy by the hand and lifts him up, verse 28. As we see Jesus' warm hand release him from Satan's cold grip. It's a great sentiment, isn't it, verse 24? And I'd love this to be our prayer for this week. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. We believe much about Jesus, all the essentials, but there's a whole lot more to Jesus than our life of faith reflects. There's a whole lot of good change that Jesus hasn't yet affected in us. We've heard much, but perhaps not very trustingly. We're perhaps not very good at applying and doing what we know. Listening well to my wife led to change as we better navigated life together. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. What would truly listening to God mean for you as we approach 2022? How does your unbelief show itself? What would increasing confidence in Jesus free you up to do? in a church and in a world where the opportunities are many but the labourers are few. You go to London and you get on the tube and you see, hear the, hear the, the warnings, mind the gap. What's important to you? And how does that compare with what's important to Jesus? And how can you mind the gap? Well, let's pray. Our great and awesome God, forgive us, please, for the pride and spirit of independence that diminishes our interest in your every word. Forgive us our complacency. Forgive us for thinking we know enough. Forgive us for thinking we've heard enough. Renew and change and grow us, Lord, for we need your revelation. Help us to listen to the piercing voice of the Lord Jesus. We've seen your glory together this morning and seen the reason to have full confidence in the one who not only teaches us, but loves us enough to die for us. Lord, we believe. Please help us in our unbelief. May we live with the conviction that you are faithful and in supreme control over all things as we put our faith in you. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.